Tonight is one of the last 10 nights and there's a lot to be said about Laylatul Qadr even though from the beginning we're going to do a disclaimer and say that the 27th night could be Laylatul Qadr and it could not be Laylatul Qadr but we're going to talk about a lot inshallah ta'ala with regards to Laylatul Qadr the plan that I have for this session is going to be simply number one a brief overview of Surah Al-Qadr itself and then number two talking about how a person can enliven the last 10 nights whatever is remaining of the last 10 nights we still have three or maybe four nights to go still seeking Laylatul Qadr and then the last thing inshallah ta'ala is going to be what I like to call the exhausted person's guide to Laylatul Qadr because some of us are burning the candle at both ends and we might need some tips on at least what's the baseline of what a person can be doing every night to make sure even if you're going to work the next day, even if you have school, even if you, you don't have the time to spend the entire night in prayer like is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu in these last 10 nights. Um, so beginning with Surah Al-Qadr, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says Inna anzannahu fi Laylat Al-Qadr that we have brought it down in Laylat Al-Qadr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought the Qur'an down on Laylatul Qadr. He says it, and it is understood that it is, it doesn't even need to be mentioned specifically because of how great it is. It's like when somebody walks in and you say, he's arrived. Or someone who everybody's anticipating comes and you say, she's arrived. And you don't even need to say who because everybody understands. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna anzannahu fi Laylatul Qadr. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ And he says, and what will allow you to know what Laylatul Qadr is? He says, Laylatul Qadri خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرِ It is better than the worship of a thousand months. Something that I want you to appreciate right from the very beginning is this night that is worth or greater than a thousand months, what was the event that made this night special? What is that event? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made Laylatul Qadr tied to the Isra' and Mi'raj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made Laylatul Qadr tied to the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made Laylatul Qadr tied to a great battle like the battle of Badr. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tied the greatest night of the year to the revelation of the Qur'an. It was the night that the Qur'an was revealed. And so the Qur'an, this is a concept that my friend, the great sheikh and poet Ibrahim Jabir said. He said, everything the Qur'an touches turns to gold. The Qur'an was revealed on Laylatul Qadr, so it becomes the best night of the year. The Qur'an was revealed through the angel Jibreel, and so he is the best angel. The Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so he's the greatest prophet. The Qur'an was revealed to this ummah, and so we're the greatest ummah. He says, everything the Qur'an touches turns to gold, so don't be afraid to let it touch your soul. The Qur'an is the great gift of this ummah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. And Allah says, inna anzannahu fi laylatul qadr. We have brought it down on the night of power. Qadr, I'm translating as power. Sometimes I'm translating as decree. What is the meaning of qadr? What does qadr mean? Scholars mention a number of reasons why it's called laylatul qadr, but I'll mention to you three of them. Number one, Qadr means, uh, it means status. So you say, Fulanun dhu Qadr. Someone, so it's, it's a, a person of great nobility. And so that's why at times it's translated as the night of power, the night of decree, or not the night of decree, but the night of power or the night of nobility. Qadr also means restriction. It means restriction. How is it the night of restriction? Because they say that the angels crowd the world on the night of Qadr so much that space is restricted. If you thought the driveway here at Click was packed, if you thought the parking lot was packed, the entire world is packed with the presence of angels on Laylatul Qadr. And so it means restriction and Qadr in the Quran comes a number of times with the meaning of restriction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقُهُ فَلْيُنْفِقْ مِمَّا أَتَاهُ اللَّهُ Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانَ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ No, فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ Allah says, فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restricts this person's risk, they say, my Lord has humiliated me. 
Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages the person who's separating or divorcing his wife. He says, وَمَنْ قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقُهُ Whoever's risk is restricted, he doesn't have a lot, then let them spend from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. The idea here is that risk also means, or qadr also means restriction. So that's one of the meanings of this night. And a third meaning is that qadr means destiny. It is the night of destiny. How is Laylatul Qadr the night of destiny? There are a number of writings that happen of a person's destiny. There is what's called an eternal writing. There is a writing of a lifetime. There is the writing every year. And there is a daily writing. These writings all happen. The first writing, which is the eternal writing, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the pen. It was the first thing that he created and he commanded it to write. The pen said, what should I write? He said, write everything until the day of judgment. And so this is the writing that happens on al-luh al-mahfuf. It is the writing that's in the preserved tablet. It is a writing that does not change. It's the first and final draft. Then you have a second writing that happens once in a person's lifetime. The Prophet Sallallahu tells us in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, he says that, That's talking about the development of the embryo until the angel is sent and it breathes in the soul of the child into their body, in the womb of the mother. And then the angel is commanded to write down four things. It's commanded to write down their lifespan, their age, their not their age, their lifespan, their actions, their risk, or whether they'll be of the people of paradise or the people of the hellfire. These four things are commanded to be written. This is alterable. This writing that happens can change. The third writing is the writing that happens on Laylatul Qadr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the beginning of Surah Al-Dukhan, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةٍ مُبَارَكَةٍ إِنَّا كُنَّا مُنْذِرِينَ فِيهَا يُفْرَقُ كُلُّ أَمْرٍ حَكِيمٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have brought down the Qur'an on a blessed night. Verily, we are warners. On this night, every matter of, uh, of uh, every matter, every, every great matter is ordained. And so this is a yearly writing that happens on Laylatul Qadr. Ibn Abbas comments on this and he said, even the pilgrims of the next year, their names are written on Laylatul Qadr. And so all of my people right now who are really, really excited about trying to go to Hajj and they're refreshing the Nusuk app every day, make sure that you are making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these nights that Allah writes you to be of the pilgrims. And in fact, the scholars mentioned that a person could be walking amongst the people وَقَدْ رُفِعَ فِي الْمَوْتَى and they have been written to be of the dead. On Laylatul Qadr, it was written that this person, this is their last year. And they're walking amongst the people now. So that's also another writing that happens yearly. And then the fourth one is a daily writing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Rahman, كُلِّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي شَأْنٍ Every day Allah is decreeing a matter. Every day Allah is decreeing a matter. So real quick pop quiz to see who's awake. Who can tell me the four writings? You have to give me all four. One shot. We're not going to do the I give one and then another person gives me another one. Who can give me all four real quick? Yes, sir. So you're giving me the four things that an angel writes in one writing, but I want the four times that the angels write, the four times in a person's existence. Yes. The eternal one. Okay, the one in the womb. The, No, no, that's one of the things. You were close. You were good. The last, the last one, day, 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 right? um, Daily. But then there's one more, yes. The womb of the mother we covered. Laylatul Qadr, which is why we're all here. Right? The third one is Laylatul Qadr. So these are the four writings. Now, three of these writings change, and one of them doesn't change. The three that change is the one that's in a person's lifespan. Sorry, it's the one that's in the womb of the mother when the angels write your lifespan and all of that. That can change. And in fact, there are hadith where the Prophet ﷺ tells us, for example, the hadith in Bukhari, he says, whoever wants for his lifespan to be extended and for his rizq to be increased, then let them connect the ties of kinship. And so connecting with your uncles and your aunts and your cousins and all of these people answering their phone calls, getting back to them, that increases your life. Number two, 
Rasulullah says, whoever wants their risk to be increased, let them connect the ties of kinship. For example, that's an example. Abdullah ibn Umar, he used to say, Oh Allah, if you have written me as one of the people who is wretched, i.e. of the people of the hellfire, then erase it and write me of the people of paradise. Indicating that it can change. Then you have the yearly one, Laylatul Qadr. Of course, you're making dua and all of these types of things so that you can change your decree. And then the daily one changes as well. So then the question becomes, why? What's the purpose of having destiny that can be changed and destiny that can't be changed? Scholars mention something beautiful. They say, even the angels, while they're writing down your lifespan, while you're in the womb of your mother, they themselves do not have full knowledge of the unseen. And so they don't know for sure that this is your final decree. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps that knowledge to himself. Even the angels don't know the unseen completely like that. In any case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You know this story, a story of revelation for why this surah was revealed in the first place. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the companions of a man who was every day would go out campaigning from Bani Israel, every day he would go out campaigning in the path of Allah, in military expeditions, and every night he would retire and pray Qiyamul Layl. How do you feel about that? This guy, every, and he did it for over 80 years. He did it for over a thousand months. What I want you to appreciate is the spirit of competition that the Sahaba had. You know, these days, in general, our life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Jannah and He says, Allah says regarding Jannah, let those who compete, compete. Like if you have competitive spirit, the way that that's supposed to manifest is in your seeking of Jannah. Ramadan is our playoffs, Ramadan is our World Cup, Ramadan is our whatever you want to call it. This is the season of competition. Everybody who says they have a competitive nature, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, this is what you should compete in. And the prophets had competitive spirit. The prophets themselves had competitive spirit. And so Musa alayhi salam, when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is coming back from speaking to Allah on the night of al-Isra, and Musa says to him, what did your Lord command you with? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam tells him, he commanded me, instructed me to 50 prayers. And Musa says, no, go back. I tried. Your ummah is not going to be able to handle it. And so the Prophet وسلم, continues to go back between Allah and Musa. Every time Allah lessening the amount of prayers that we were obligated to pray, and every time Musa saying to him, Go back, no, that's too much. You're not going to be able, your ummah is not going to be able to handle it. Trust me. I dealt with Bani Israel before. When finally Rasulullah comes back to Musa and says, He instructed me with five prayers, and Musa says to him, Go back. People aren't going to be able to do five a day. Rasulullah says, I'm ashamed of asking my Lord for more. That's it. Musa, when the Prophet leaves, Musa weeps, and they asked him, Why did you, are you weeping? He said, Because of this young man who was sent after me, more of his ummah are going to enter Jannah than my ummah. Musa is is grieved that his ummah is not going to be as large as the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. But don't think that that's out of any sort of jealousy. Musa السلام, in that moment is showing incredible greatness. Because even as that's something that saddens him, he is being the most sincere advisor to this ummah, the most sincere advisor to the Prophet ﷺ. Every time you pray five and all you have to do is pray five, you say, Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on Musa. It could have been ten. Could have been 20, could have been 30, could have been 40. But Musa continued to argue with our Prophet ﷺ and encourage him to go back and ask for less. The point here is that spirit of competition. Rasulullah ﷺ says that on the day of judgment, he wants to have the largest number of followers on the day of judgment. So he says, marry women, tazawwajul wadud al walud. Marry women that are wadud, that are loving, and walud, that produce a lot of children. Why? He says, فَإِنِّي مُكَاثِرٌ بِكُمْ الْأُمَّمْ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ I want to boast the largest number of followers on the Day of Judgment. That's that spirit of competition. When everybody shows up with whoever followers they have, Rasulullah wants to have the horizon full with his ummah. The Sahaba learned that from the Prophet And so the Sahaba would compete. They competed in everything that there was to compete. Umar is chasing Abu Bakr because he sees that Abu Bakr is ahead of him. The poor companions come and complain about the rich companions. I've never heard 
the poor companions complaining about the rich companions other than in one particular hadith. They didn't complain about their resources, they didn't complain about their horses, they didn't complain about their houses, they didn't complain about anything. Other than they said, Ya Rasulullah, ذهب أهل الدثور بالأجور. They said, O Messenger of Allah, the rich have taken all of the reward. They pray like we pray, and they fast like we fast, and they give charity that we don't give. Right now, when we were sitting in this fundraiser for Click, and Sheikh Walid goes off and starts at $50,000. Was that the highest? That's what he started at, right? $50,000. I'm assuming almost all of us did not give $50,000, because I think it was just one person. But were we sitting there between us, were we sitting there annoyed, upset, fuming in our seats that there's somebody tonight who's giving the most and it's not me? Because that's what the poor companions came and complained about. They said, Ya Rasulullah, they're taking the reward. This person is saying 50,000, this person is saying 40,000, this person is saying 30,000, this person is 20, the tens are going like this, the fives are going like this. And I'm sitting here waiting for Sheikh Wadi to get down to $50 or $100 so that I can raise my hand. And they never got down to that. We just got a general dua at the end. Right? That's, that's, that's how the poor companions, they, they, this was so real for them that they literally come and complain to the Prophet ﷺ about that. They're like, Ya Rasulullah, the rich are taking all of the reward. Because they're fasting like we're fasting. They're praying Qiyam like we're, they're in Taraweeh like But here they are, there's this avenue, there's this lane that they are competing on and I'm, I don't have access to that. And so the Prophet ﷺ says to them, do you not have something that you can give in sadaqah? Every time you say subhanallah sadaqah, every time you say alhamdulillah sadaqah, every time you say la ilaha illallah sadaqah, every time you say Allahu Akbar sadaqah. And then the poor companions, they snatch that, they take it, and then they start practicing that. That's something that we can do. I can't give money, but I can do this. And then the rich found out about that and started doing it too. And so they came back to the Prophet ﷺ and complained again. They said, Ya Rasulullah, they heard about what we're doing and they're doing it too. Like, look at how serious this is for them. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, That is the, the bounty of Allah. He gives it to whomever he wishes. But the question that we have to have is, who are we competing against right now? You know, um, Abu Muslim al-Khawalani, he has a beautiful statement. He's from the Tabi'een. He didn't see the Prophet, but he met the Sahaba. But I want you to imagine the Tabi'een, in some sense there's like this great sense of loss. It's like we just missed the Prophet ﷺ by 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. And so Abu Muslim al-Khawalani, he was praying Qiyamul Layl one night. He didn't have energy drinks. The caffeine wasn't, coffee wasn't a thing. And he was getting tired. And so while he was battling with his sleeplessness, he slaps his leg and he wakes himself up. And he says this amazing statement. He says, أَيَظُنُّ أَصْحَابُ مُحَمَّدٍ أَيَسْتَأْثِرُوا بِهِ دُونَنَا كَلَّا وَاللَّهِ لَنُزَاحِمَنَّهُمْ عَلَى الْحَوْتِ He says, do the companions of Muhammad think that they're going to have him exclusively again in the Akhirah? No, by Allah. We are going to crowd them at the pool. حَتَّى يَعْلَمُوا أَنَّهُمْ خَلَّفُوا رِجَالًا So that they know that the people who came behind him are men. Like, okay, Allah's qadr was that we come 1400 years after the Prophet we, we missed him by a long shot. But do the Sahaba think that they're going to have him exclusively again? No, no, no. On the day of judgment, when the ummah is crowded at the pool, I'm going to be right there. I'm going to be right there. I am going to crowd them at the pool so that they know that the ones who came behind are men as well. Like we, we, we held it down too. But that's competing. A person is visualizing. A person is competing with those who are ahead of them. So the question then is, in these last 10 nights or 3 nights or 4 nights or whatever it's left, who are you competing with? Who have you noticed, for example, in the masjid is always in the first row. They're just always on time. They're on point. Who's reading more Quran than you? Who's showing, who amongst your siblings is showing a better bir to your parents than you? Who is, who is volunteering more? at the masjid than you? Who's distributing more food than you? Who's, who's being more warm than you? Like, who are you competing with? 
we compete naturally with the dunya and we compare ourselves to each other in the dunya. But the Prophet ﷺ told us not to do that. Who cares about the dunya? It's not about who has a better job or who makes more money or who has this or who has that. But rather it is in the akhirah. And Allah says that is where competitors need to compete. So the first thing that we have to do as far as an approach goes is just have that spirit of competition. Have a little bit of that competitive energy or a lot of it when it comes to what we are seeking right now. Then number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, and, and sorry, this entire surah was revealed, one of the causes of revelation is because of that man. The Prophet sallallahu told them of that man who for a thousand months was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that level, jihad in the path of Allah during the day, qiyamul layl at night. And the sahaba, when they heard that story, they weren't just like, oh, that's a nice story from someone in the past. They had that spirit of competition that said that, Ya Rasulullah, one of us doesn't even live 80 years. We don't even get to live that long. Our ummah is, our, our, our lifespans are much shorter, between 60 and 70. And so the Prophet ﷺ tells them of that man, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to their response by saying, Laylatul Qadri Khair min al Fishar. The night of power, or the night of decree, or the night of restriction is better than the worship of a thousand months. So in one night, because of the favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon this ummah, we get the reward of more than a thousand nights of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَتَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرٍ Allah says, the angels descend and the ruh, and the ruh is Jibreel. The angel Jibreel comes down on Laylatul Qadr, تَتَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ i.e. by the permission of their Lord, by the permission of the, their Lord, and with every command, سَلَامٌ هِيَ حَتَّى مَطْلَعِ الْفَجْرِ It is peace and tranquility until the morning time. The scholars debate, and they say, what is better, the day or the night? And they put forth a lot of arguments that the night is better than the day. Of the arguments that the night is better than the day is that Laylatul Qadr is at night, the Qur'an was revealed at night, the Prophet ﷺ had his first revelation of experience at night, they said that the night is the time of the majority of the prayers, Maghrib and Isha and Fajr, and that the night is a time of better focus and spirituality and worship. It's when everything settles and everything stills. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the, the prayer of the night grants you that steadfastness. In any case, what are some of the things that a person can do when they're seeking Laylatul Qadr? Number one, the first is Salah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَنْ قَامَ لَيْلَةَ الْقَدْرِ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمْ مِنْ ذَبِهِ That whoever stands the night of power, the night of destiny, that their sins will be forgiven. So standing on Laylatul Qadr, that you pray what you can, like we just did. And the bare minimum of what's considered to be Qiyamul Layl is two rak'ahs, as Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said. Ibn Abbas said that if a person prays two rak'ahs after Isha, فَقَدْ بَاتِ لِرَبِّهِ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا That person has spent the entire night in prayer if they've prayed two rak'ahs after Isha. So at the very least, no matter how busy I get, tomorrow, the day after, Sunday, which is the day after, Monday if there is, no, Monday there will be, Tuesday night if there is, that at the very least I always make sure no matter how busy I get that I pray something of the night. And Salah, the Prophet ﷺ says, is khayru mawdu'i. It is the best object, it is the best thing that a person can do. Salah. Salah combines all of these beautiful acts of worship, like the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's in the Salah. Like dua, it is in the Salah. Like recitation of the Quran, it's all in the Salah. All of that is all in the Salah anyway. And so a person praying with focus. Number two is after Salah is recitation of the Quran. Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, Wala dhikrullahi akbar. That the dhikr of Allah is greater than everything. But yet the greatest dhikr is the Quran. The greatest of all dhikr is the Quran. And so a person making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by recitation of the Quran. Whatever a person can read of the Qur'an, if you're tired standing, that you sit down and you read what you can. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that the Qur'an be recited. And then number three is dua itself. Dua, Sufyan al-Thawri says, that dua is more beloved to me in this night than even salah. Dua comes part and parcel with Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verses in Surah Al-Baqarah where he talks about Ramadan, in the middle he mentions 
this concept of dua. Allah in the verses of fasting, right in the middle, he sandwiches this verse where he says, if my servants ask you about me, then I am near, I respond to the call of the caller when they call upon me. That being said, Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, in the hadith that's reported by Tirmidhi, she asked the Prophet sallallahu she said, if I know that a night is Laylatul Qadr, what should I say? And Rasulullah sallallahu said to her, say, Allahumma innaka afoon tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anni. Oh Allah, you are afu. Tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anni. You love afu. So have afu on me. Question, what does afu mean? What does afu mean? Who can give me a, a good translation for afu? Yes. To erase it? So much so that it's not even present at all. That's exactly it. Is there a single word though to, to use for that? Because generally when you, when you choose one word, you just use pardon. But it is exactly that. Affat al and al the Arabs would say that the wind erased affat, it erased the trace of the footprints. And so afu is for the sin to be erased. On the day of judgment, that thing that I did, if afu has already happened, it's not even there, it's not on my record, we're not gonna talk about it because it never happened. And that's the best. And so you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Laylatul Qadr, oh Allah, you are afu. And look at this dua. This dua begins by number one, mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name. And then number two, emphasizing, Allahumma innaka afun tuhibbu al-afu, you love afu. So I'm seeking nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by mentioning his name, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that tawheed, and then it's followed with tawkeed, it's followed with emphasis, you love it. You love to pardon, you love to erase the trace of sins. So erase mine. This is the highest level. You know, in, in the end of Surah uh, Al-Baqarah, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for three things, four things actually. You say, wa'fu anna, waghfir lana, warhamna. You say, oh Allah, have afu on us. Erase the trace of our sins. And then you say, waghfir lana. And maghfira means what? What does maghfira mean? Okay, it means to forgive, but I need something a little bit more detailed. I need something a little bit more. What does maghfira mean, technically? Maghfira is to be protected from the harm of your sins. It's to be protected from the harm of your sins. A mighfar is the helmet that they would wear in battle. It's called a mighfar. It protects you from the harm of your enemy. And so maghfira is to be protected from the harm of my sins. Afu is for the sins to be erased. It's not going to show up on the Day of Judgment. But maghfira is that it's still on my record. However, I am protected from its harm. And then number three, so now at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, you're basically asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for number one, uh, afu. I'm also asking for maghfira. I'm also asking for rahma. And the rahma is, oh Allah, just embrace me in your mercy. The sin is there, it's present, I have no protection from it, I don't have any maghfira, I'm just banking on your mercy, oh Allah, envelop me in it. So it's, it's three steps. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, or the Prophet وسلم, says on Laylatul Qadr, no, you seek out the best of them. You seek out the highest. And interestingly enough, at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, you say, Anta Mawlana, you are our protector. Fansurna ala al-qawmi al-kafirin. So give us victory over the disbelievers. I always, used to rem I always used to wonder, what is the relationship? Where is the transition? Oh Allah, forgive us, have mercy on us, give us victory over the disbelievers. Like, do you notice that shift? It's like almost a completely different subject. What is the relationship between forgiveness of sins and victory over the disbelievers? Actually, it's very, very linear and it's very clear. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he used to write to his generals and he used to say to them, Innama tunsaruna min as He would say to them, you are given victory from the heavens. You are only given victory because you sin less than your enemy. You don't have more resources than the Romans. You don't have more, you don't have bigger bodies than the Persians. You're not stronger than these armies that you're meeting. You don't have more resources than them. However, 
you are given victory because you sin less than them. And then he would say, if you become equal in your sins, then it goes back to whoever has better resources. And so we're saying to Allah, Oh Allah, these sins of ours, forgive them, have mercy on them, and give us victory over the disbelievers. Do not let our sins become an impediment between us and victory. And that brings me back to this topic of dua. Aisha anha is taught by the Prophet وسلم, to say, Allahumma innaka afoon tu hibbul afwa fa afu anni. I want to mention two quick points about this dua, and then I want to mention some of the impediments for what our dua or why our dua may not be accepted. Number one, the scholars mention two meanings to this dua or two reasons. Yeah, let's say two meanings. Number one, they say that this dua is really perfect and appropriate for these nights, Laylatul Qadr. And you say, oh Allah, forgive me. I want you to appreciate that Laylatul Qadr could have been on any day of the calendar year. It could have been on the 15th of Muharram. It could have been on the 3rd of Rajab. It could have been on any random day. And we would have had all of the energy in the world. We would have been so fresh and so ready to come on one night and just worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala super hard and then go home. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it at the end of Ramadan, the last 10 nights, when you are already dehydrated for 20 days and sleep deprived for 20 days, and you're already holding on by a thread because you've been trying for the past 20 days. And then when it seems like you're already on empty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know what, there's 10 more days and I put a super surprise for you. But you have to go until the end and you have to, you have to, leave the tank on empty. So after those 20 days, now you don't even get to rest, you have to go even harder. And still, even as you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a level, I think we can all agree, when Ramadan comes, the last 10 nights come, we are worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a level that we don't the entire year. And yet still, your dua, while you are staying up and making dua and you've cut off all of the nonsense that we all engage in outside of the year and we're trying as best as we can to watch our gaze and watch what we hear and avoid all of these things we're not asking Allah for acceptance we're asking Allah for forgiveness we're asking Allah for forgiveness and that's a common motif in our acts of worship we don't just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness for our sins we actually ask Allah forgiveness for our good deeds Yes, we ask Allah forgiveness for our good deeds. So as soon as you're done with salah, what's one of the first things that you say? Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Why are you seeking Allah's forgiveness when you just fulfilled a pillar of Islam? A pillar. You're asking Allah for forgiveness because you know that this salah that you just offered is not what Allah deserves. This salah where you were thinking about where you parked your car and you were thinking about the assignment that you have after and you jumped right after the salah to check your phone because your mind was on something during the salah. That salah that you just offered to the king of kings and the creator of the heavens and the earth, the ones who the angels bow down to and prostrate to and never lift their heads up out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you just prayed that raggedy prayer and you offered it to him. And so you seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. And even if you were to pray the best prayer of your life, you would still ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness afterwards because it's still not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves. And so Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about those verses in Surah Al-Mu'minun. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوَ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةٌ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَرْجِعُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ هُمْ لَهَا سَابِقُونَ Those who offer what they offer and their hearts are trembling. They're scared, they're terrified that they're going back to their lords. They're the ones who race to goodness. They, 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 they rush to it. Aisha asked the Prophet, she said, Ya Rasulullah, are these the people who drink? Like these people who are terrified and scared, are they the ones who drink and, 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 and commit theft and things like that? And he said to her, no, Ya Bint Siddiq. No, these are the people who pray and fast and they're afraid that it's not going to be accepted of them. And so we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. So it's appropriate that a person, while they are offering what they offer of, of incredible energy, that they're still asking Allah forgiveness because you recognize with humility that you're not offering, none of us are offering what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves. But then there's a second meaning to this dua, and that dua is, it's tied to the idea that Laylatul Qadr is the night of destiny. 
And so if my destiny is being written tonight for the next year, I am asking Allah, Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afu fa afu anni. Oh Allah, afu, one of the meanings of afu is what? It is ease, facilitation, protection. So Allah protect me in this next year. Don't throw things at me that I can't bear. Don't send calamities my way. I'm asking you Allah for afu and afia. You love to make things easy. You love to protect, so protect me. And so you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. Now, what are some of the impediments of dua? I want to mention to you two quick things. Possibly three, possibly one. We'll see how it goes. Number one, one of the greatest impediments for dua, of our dua being accepted, is our sins. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says in the hadith that's reported by Muslim, the hadith of Abu Hurairah, the famous, famous hadith. He gives the example of a man who'd been traveling in the desert for a while. Ash'ath aghbar, dusty and disheveled. Yamuddu yadayhi ila sama. He's raising his hands towards the sky and saying, Ya Rabbu, Ya Rabb! My Lord, my Lord! And his food was haram, and his drink was haram, and his nourishment was haram. And the Prophet says, how can his du'a be accepted? How can that person's du'a be accepted? This person normally would have their du'a fast-tracked. This person is a traveler, this person is broken, they're dusty and disheveled, they're not arrogant, they're not pompous in that moment, they're broken. And yet the Prophet ﷺ said the thing that caused for his dua to be so distant from being accepted was all of their haram income, all of their haram nourishment, all of their haram sustenance. And so the lesson that we learned, it's possible that this guy, his dua didn't get accepted and he made his way back home and he's telling people, I have had a faith crisis because I made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he didn't respond to me. I am making dua to Allah, I was stranded in the middle of the desert and I didn't get any help. I don't believe that God exists. How many people complain about their dua being delayed as if, why, why, why didn't Allah respond to me? I made such sincere dua. But the Prophet ﷺ is telling us of a major, major caveat that we would do well to pay attention to. And that is, is my sustenance halal? I'm drowning in interest. But here I am making dua on the 27th night. And I'm asking why hasn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered my dua? I'm injuring people left and right. I'm oppressing people left and right. I owe money to people that I haven't paid back even though I have the money to pay them back. But who cares? I'm just going to put them on pause for now. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Matlul ghani zulm. That the delay in payment of somebody who has money is oppression. That's zulm. It's injustice. So my point here is that people commit sins left and right and they don't realize that this could be an impediment very well of your dua being accepted. So then what does a person do on a night like this? So like, okay, I can't solve my credit card issue right now. I can't solve my loan issue right now. I can't solve these things. I need to make dua though on the 27th night. Don't tell me that I can't because of things that I've accrued. The answer to that is Tawbah. You can repent tonight. I can turn a new leaf tonight and I can say, Oh Allah, you are the controller of the heavens and the earth. I repent to you from this sin. You're the one who says be and it can be. You're the one who, if you say yes, it doesn't matter who says no. And if you say no, it doesn't matter who says yes. I'm repenting to you of this sin. Find for me a way out. Make for me a way out. Toba is one of the greatest acts that a person can do in these last 10 nights. That a person starts anew with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it becomes one of the greatest factors that cause for a person's du'a to be accepted. is to perceive that du'a with righteous actions. Whether those righteous actions be charity, whether those righteous actions be uh, tawbah, whether those act righteous actions be istighfar, whether those righteous actions be salah, or anything like that. Anyway, there's a lot that can be said. I don't want to drag on too long, but I'll just end with this. There's um, the, uh, I'll share with you a couple of, of tips on at least having a baseline for the remaining days. What is the baseline that we can have? Because obviously the maximum is to just be up all night, every night, striving as hard as you can, like the Prophet did. But 
for those of us who don't have that opportunity, what are some of the, the baseline things that we can make sure that we hit every single night? Number one is to do what was done earlier today, which is to pray taraweeh with the imam until the imam complete, is completed. Until the imam finishes, basically. And if you do that, you get the reward of praying the entire night. So that's number one. And by the way, the imam means the congregation. So if a person says, okay, Abdullah finished after four, Sheikh Walid took over so I can leave because that imam is done. No, 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 it's the whole congregation. So if you, and until they pray the witr prayer. So if you have limited time, then don't go to a masjid that prays 20 rak'ahs. Be smart with where you go. Go to a masjid that's light so that you can pray with them for the entire uh, duration of the prayer. But then let's say I can't even do that. I don't have the time to do that. Rasulullah tells us that whoever prays Isha in congregation gets the reward of praying half of the night, and whoever prays Fajr in congregation gets the reward of praying the entire night. So at least I come in and I pray Isha with the Jama'ah, and then I leave. It's okay. People are going to look at me and they're going to realize that I was in town and that I didn't. It doesn't matter. Praying Isha, and it's something that you should always remember that praying Isha is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than praying Taraweeh. A lot of times people make the mistake of coming late, missing Isha, and catching Taraweeh, whatever. But Isha is more beloved because it's obligatory. And Fajr is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a person praying Tahajjud. So if I pray Tahajjud, but I'm gonna crash like an hour before Fajr because I've been up all night, that's not a good habit to have. It's better, more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you pray Fajr in congregation. So it's all about knowing how to prioritize. Number three, let me see here. What was number three? Uh, we already talked about praying two rak'ahs after Isha. Number four is if you need to sleep, be intentional. If you need to sleep, be intentional. Because the Prophet wasallam says that whoever goes to his bed intending to get up and pray Qiyam at night, then sleep overwhelms him until morning, will have recorded that which he intended, and his sleep is a charity given to him by his Lord. It does not get better than that. A person, if they went to sleep and they're intending, I'm going to wake up at 2 a.m., I'm going to wake up at 3 a.m., I'm going to wake up at 4 a.m., whatever. They're intending to pray. If that person, but intention here means commitment. Like it's realistic. Like I've set my alarm. Like I put myself in a position to do it. However, if that person is overwhelmed by sleep, they still get the reward of everything that they did and that sleep that they actually slept is charity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all it takes is for you to be intentional when you go to sleep. That you don't just go home and collapse without a thought. That you actually sit down and you think to yourself that you are inshallah ta'ala going to wake up for that period of time. Number five, if you wake, wake your family too. If you wake, wake your family too. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in his last, in the last 10 nights, uh, he was described as Shadda uh, Ahlahu, he would waken his family. The Prophet would waken, he would waken his family, and he would enliven his night. So waking up your family. And the Prophet he told us that when a man wakens at night and wakes his wife and they pray to rak'ahs together, they are recorded among the men and women who are ذاكرين الله كثيرا. They who mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. And it's vice versa, a woman who wakes up her husband or a husband who wakes up his wife, that if you wake them up, if you wake each other up, and then you pray two rak'ahs, and the two rak'ahs don't need to be together, it doesn't need to be a congregational prayer, but everyone prays on their own. They will be recorded as those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much. But the scholars mention this is for somebody who you know would love to wake up. Yani, if you wake up your wife, and she's gonna start swinging at you because <laughs> it's, you know, she just went to sleep with the baby, for example. Like, that's not what the objective is here. But the objective is if the spouses know that they would love to be waking up, and then they wake up. Uh, don't forget dua and dhikr, number six, to make a lot of dua, and we mentioned that one already. But I would also mention this. This beautiful du'a of Allahumma innaka afun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anni that a person as well share it with their family members. Teach it to your, you know, your cousins. In the masjid here even, young people, ask them, do you know the du'a of Laylatul Qadr? Sheikh Abdul Razak, uh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Razak Al-Abbad. He's a scholar in Medina. He tells this beautiful story and he said that he was 
him and his, his father and his grandfather, and he's from a family of scholarship. They were, travel, they were going to the Haram in Medina for Taraweeh in the last 10 nights. And some young men were in a car nearby and they just had the music blasting. And so he said, I went to them and I said to them, listen, everybody's going and they're seeking out you know, worship in the last 10 nights. If y'all aren't going to participate in all of that, then at least you know, turn, down the, turn down the music. And so he said they did. And then I talked to them and I said, do you know the dua of Laylatul Qadr? And they said, no. And then he said, Allahumma inna ka'afoon tuhibbu l'afa fa'afu anni. He said, say it back to me. He said, they said it back. I said to them, say it, repeat it again. He said, I, I, I kept making them repeat it until they learned it. And then I said, make sure that tonight you make this dua a lot. You don't have to come to the masjid, you don't, whatever. You're not going to do all of that. At least make this dua a lot. He said, years later, like five or six years later, I was traveling somewhere in the country for an, a lecture. And there was a young man who came, he came up to me and he was, you know, he seemed like a very nice young man. And the, he came and he sat down next to me. He said, Sheikh, do you remember me? He said, no. He said, uh, do you remember that incident? He said, and he kept reminding me until I remember. And he said, you know, that dua, I kept saying it that night and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed my heart. Everything that I was attracted to of evil from before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced it with a love for the deen and the love of the Qur'an and the love of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And so the shaykh was saying, this is a, a, a powerful dua. When you're asking Allah for afu, part of it included is the changing of a person's heart. If I'm attracted to a sin, there's something that I'm, I'm still too attached to. I'm not even, you know, there's sometimes you'll have a person who's making dua in the last 10 nights, Oh, Allah changed my heart about everything. But they've got one sin that they're still keeping in their pocket. They're like, I'll save this one for next Ramadan. This one is still a little bit too close. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls your heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes your heart. So asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change your heart. And this dua is one of the greatest mechanisms that a person's heart can be changed. And then the last thing that I'll mention is the importance of, of charity, obviously, in this night, in these nights. That a person gives charity. Alhamdulillah, there's a million different projects where you can automate your charity. You know, you don't want to be that person who a night goes by and you're like, man, I didn't read Quran tonight. I didn't make dhikr tonight. I didn't uh, pray two rak'ahs tonight. I didn't give charity tonight. And a person can automate their charity. You can, I mean, there's a lot of different uh, ways for you to set it and forget it in these last 10 nights as well. And then the last thing that I'll mention is the most important factor of all of this is that a person beyond the outer limbs and the outer acts of worship is that a person journeys to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their heart in these last 10 nights. That a person as best as they can try to muster every ounce of sincerity, every ounce of truthfulness, every ounce of humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brokenness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah accepts from the people of taqwa. Um, al dahak was asked by Juwaybir. al dahak is one of the scholars of tafsir from the second generation, and he learned from many of the companions. And al dahak was asked, the woman who is uh, in postpartum, and the one who's in menstruation, and the traveler, and the one sleeping, do they have a share of Laylatul Qadr? You might have a guy right now, or a girl, who's traveling on the 27th night. What share do they have of Laylatul Qadr? A person who's overwhelmed by sleep, what share do they have of Laylatul Qadr? The woman who's menstruating, what share do they have of Laylatul Qadr? And so al dahak he said, yes, everyone with accepted actions will have a share of Laylatul Qadr. Everyone who has accepted actions. And so at the end of the day, Shaykh bin Baz comments on this and he says, it is legislated for the believer to race towards every good and to take advantage of opportunities and to humble themselves in front of Allah and their actions be propelled by sincerity, truthfulness, and hope in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for the value of everything is by the sincerity it carries and the truthfulness it is done with and the perfection of it. How many single rak'ahs are better than hundreds of rak'ahs and how many dirhams are better than many dirhams and two people might be praying side by side and the difference between them is like the distance between the heavens and the earth. So as best as I can in these last four nights, I try to focus on my quality. If I'm praying two rak'ahs, let them be the best two rak'ahs that I could possibly pray. Maybe I won't be able to pray 100 rak'ahs or 20 rak'ahs or 30 rak'ahs, but let me pray these two as perfectly as I can. If I give sadaqah, let me be cognizant. I, just, I don't just go in and swipe the card and not care, but that I sit and I be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, so much of this ummah is in turmoil and you gave me safety. Oh Allah, so much of this ummah is, is, is 
is deserving of zakah and you made me somebody who's able to pay zakah. There's so many people who are deserving of sadaqah and in need of sadaqah. And you may be somebody who can give sadaqah. You've given my family so much. You've blessed me with so much. Oh Allah, let me give this charity with incredible gratitude and humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I can muster up and make my ikhlas better in every action that I do, it increases the reward, it increases the acceptance. And at the end, it's all about accepted actions. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us all our seeking of Laylatul Qadr, and may we be of those who witness it, and may we be of those whose sins are forgiven. Allahumma ameen. I was not expecting for it to go this long, but Jazakumullah khair. I guess if there's any quick comments or anything like that, I'll take them. Otherwise, we'll end now. Yes. Yeah. Which one? Allahumma inna ka'afun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anni? No, no, you can make it any time of the year. But it is the dua for the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Yeah. You hear it in Jum'ah khutbahs, you hear it all, all over the place. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Excellent question. Fantastic question that I did not mention. The Quran was revealed over 23 years and the Quran was revealed on Laylatul Qadr. So which one is it? It's both. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr indicates anzala means to bring it uh, down once. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says nazzalnahu which means to bring it down multiple times. So on Laylatul Qadr the Quran was brought down from al Mahfuz to the first heaven. It was brought down to the first heaven. That being said, Jibreel does not bring the Qur'an down from the first heaven to the Prophet Sallallahu Jibreel hears the Qur'an from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and then brings it down to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the Qur'an was brought down on Laylatul Qadr to the first heaven and then also over 23 years the Qur'an was brought down by Jibreel from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the reason why I'm particular saying that it's important to know that Jibreel alayhi salam did not bring it down from al al mahfuz because then the chain would be broken. Jibreel would not be bringing it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Jibreel hears it from Allah and brings it down to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Great question though. Any other great questions? Yes. Oh, fantastic question. These really are great questions. I didn't mention at all the positions on what night Laylatul Qadr is. Siba, that's a Siba question. Okay, time out. So, Abu Sa'id al Khudri said that Laylatul Qadr is on the 21st night. Ibn Abbas said that it's on the 23rd and 27th night. Ubay ibn Ka'ab swore that it's on the 27th night. And each one of them has narrations. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says that it's, if you want to seek out Laylatul Qadr, you have to seek it out the entire year, all year. So, what are their evidences? Number one, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said that the Prophet ﷺ made i'tikaf in the middle 10 days of Ramadan seeking out Laylatul Qadr and then on the 20th night, the Prophet ﷺ was told, and this hadith is in Bukhari, he said, I was shown that what we are seeking is actually ahead of us. It's still ahead. So whoever is seeking Laylatul Qadr, let him continue to make i'tikaf until the end of the month. So they went for... for and he said, I was shown a vision of me prostrating between water and mud on Laylatul Qadr. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri says, and there wasn't even a cloud in the sky on the 21st day or the 20th day before the 21st night. He said, but that night it rained. And I saw the Prophet Sallallahu prostrating between water and mud. So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri says, Laylatul Qadr is 21st night. I have, a, I have an incident. Then number two, you have Abdullah ibn Abbas being asked by Umar ibn Khattab, what night is Laylatul Qadr? And Abdullah ibn Abbas says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, it, it is either the 23rd or the 27th night. And Umar says to him, how did you know that? Abdullah ibn Abbas says, listen, Allah made seven heavens, made seven earths, made our days of the week seven, made our food out of seven. So seven is a common theme here. So it's either the 23rd or the 27th, meaning seven days remaining or seven days having passed. And so Umar said to him, you have 
notice something that we all didn't notice before. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, seven days or seven days? Uh, seven days past or seven days? Then we have, uh, who's left? Ubay ibn Ka'ab. Ubay ibn Ka'ab, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, we said, he said, and he was in Iraq. He told people, he said, listen, anybody wants to experience Laylatul Qadr, you got to pray all year. 360 days a year, you'll experience Laylatul Qadr. So then, people come from Iraq and they meet Ubay ibn Ka'ab in Medina. And they say, your brother, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, is saying, that whoever wants to experience Laylatul Qadr, he has to stand the entire year. And so Ubay ibn Ka'ab said, he knows by Allah what night it is. He knows. But he doesn't want you to rely on it. Meaning he doesn't want the entire ummah to not show up and then just pack the driveways of every masjid in the world on the 27th night and then call it a day. Right? When people are leaving the masjid on the 27th night, they're saying, Eid Mubarak, Eid Mubarak. No, there's still three nights left, four nights left. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud did not want this to happen. So he didn't tell them. He's like, you got to pray the entire year. But Ubay ibn Ka'ab said, it is the 27th night. And he said, how do you know that? He said, because of the sign the Prophet told us. What's the sign? That the next day the sun rises without rays. It's a very gentle sun. So then the question becomes, how do you resolve these different narrations from the companions? How do you resolve that? Ubay ibn Ka'ab is swearing it's the 27th. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri is giving you clear evidence that it's the 21st. The scholar said that Laylatul Qadr rotates. It rotates. In one year, it could be the 21st. In another year, it could be the 22nd. Another year, it could be the 23rd. Another year, it could be the 24th. Why am I saying the even uh, nights as well? Because the Prophet sallallahu said, seek it out in the odd nights. But he also said, seek it out with nine nights remaining. Seven nights remaining, five nights remaining. And if the month is 30, then that's fantastic. Nine nights remaining is an odd night. But if the month ends up being 29, then nine nights remaining is what? It's an even. Seven nights remaining is an even number. Five nights remaining is an even number. So in reality, we have to try every single night of the last 10 nights. But the scholars mention and the majority of scholars hold that the 27th night is weighted more than the others. So if I've only got one shot, then I go for the 27th night. But it could very easily be another night as well. Great question. Last great question before we end. Yes. Oh, so you're saying, Allahumma innaka afoon tuhibbul afu fa afu anni. Should I say, oh Allah, you are forgiving, you love to forgive, so forgive me? Or should I say, forgive all of us? It's fine, either way. Either way is fine. Whichever one you want to do. Yes. If I'm understanding your question, you're saying, does dua change the decree that happens on Laylatul Qadr? Dua changes all three of those writings. Dua changes the writing that happens in a person's, the womb of their mother. Dua changes the writing that happens on Laylatul Qadr. And dua changes the daily writing. The only one that does not change is the first and final draft. Because your dua that you were going to make to alter those things is already written there. Huh? The preserved tablet. Yes. Jazakumullah khair, everybody. Don't want to hold everybody hostage anymore. Jazakumullah khair. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa